Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about defensive driving since I've been working like crazy on the defensive driving course here at Smart Drive Test trying to get that up for you and get that available for you. And that has been challenging, especially since my computer went back to Apple last week. And you can see here behind me that uh, you're getting more of a view of my office because I couldn't get the camera to work either. And uh, you're probably <laughs> noticing that the live stream isn't as cool as it should be. So next week, the new computer is coming. So we're hopefully getting all of that going. Hey, Tim, how are you tonight? Uh, Savita, I failed twice and you've lost your confidence. What should I do? Savita, uh, take a day, be down, you know, uh, eat Doritos on the chi on the couch, you know, watch telly for a day and then get back at it and do it again. Failing your road test is not a reflection of who you are as a person. It just means that you need a little bit more work and a little bit more practice. So uh, just adjusting something here. There we go. So that should get the line out of there. Uh, Penny's here. And Penny, if your practice is good, uh, the other thing I would suggest uh, with your practice is go and do a practice driving test with a driving school. Go and book a road test and see what, uh, what feedback they give you. And if you need any more help or feedback with that, then certainly you know, practice a little bit more on the things that they give you. So, okay, uh, there we go. Thanks, Corey, for both working bricks for wheels. Corey's the moderator here. He keeps out the bad people who <laughs> like to spam the live stream. And uh, you know you're doing well on YouTube when you start getting uh, spammed, your live, sp live stream gets spammed. So I'm gonna answer any questions you have about passing a road test. It's a long weekend here in Canada. It's Queen, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's birthday. Uh, Queen Elizabeth died in 1901. I think she, you know, that was the year that she died. She was queen in England for most of the 19th century. So, a little bit of history lesson there. All right. So, uh, yes, Penny, Dave, how are you going? Uh, new computer's not here yet, Dave. Uh, Thursday, end of the week. So, hopefully, next week the live stream's going to tune up here and we'll get going again on all of that. Um, uh, Fuad. Rev matching. Rev matching is a racing technique that they use in racing to slow down the vehicle. And what happens is that when you brake a vehicle, I'll show you this, when you brake the vehicle, the front end sits down like this. You get a weight transfer. And the reason that they do rev matching in racing is to keep the vehicle on an even keel. Because what happens uh, when you go around a corner and you brake, the front end sets down, the back end of the vehicle lifts up and you lose control and you oversteer. So what they do by rev matching is they um, slow the vehicle down, but they keep it on an even keel. And rev matching takes tens of thousands of hours of practice in a car to be able to do it well. So <laughs> they're watching. Ah, uh, you distracted me, Tim. So rev matching is not something you should be doing every day in a regular car. I know there are other channels out here that say that yes, learn how to rev match and those types of things. That's rubbish. It's total rubbish. For everyday driving of a manual vehicle, you do not need to know how to rev match. Simply slow the vehicle down and pull it down into the appropriate gear. Okay, and there are probably going to be some people who disagree with me. That's fine. I don't agree with it. Racing, rev matching and racing techniques have no place in everyday driving. You're not, you're just not doing it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tim, for that correction. Yes, it's Queen Victoria, not Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth is still very much alive and well and reigning the uh, the British Empire. So there we go. Hagen, uh, I'd have a video on how to look back but stay straight when backing up because I turn the wheel when I look back but want to stay straight and I want to know how to do it while parallel parking. So Hagen, there is a video here on backing. And what you do is you go out and find one of those videos on or not videos rather, one of the back alleys and practice backing up in a straight line. <laughs> and that will help you to reverse and will help you in your overall driving. So that's what I suggest you do in terms of reversing and backing up. How to back up a 53 inch truck, glam. Uh, what are you looking for in terms of a 53 inch truck? When you say 53 inches, is it 53 inches wide or is the sleeper 53 inches? What's 53 inches on it? Uh, Dave, what should you do if you fail the road test? Uh, be upset, blame the driving examiner, go home, eat Doritos, sit on the couch in your underwear, uh, watch all of the Indiana Jones movies, 
uh, for a day and then the next day get up start practicing again and then uh, you know go back and do the test again so there you go Sebastian how are you Mohammed uh, very restrictive examiner Mohammed you got to focus on what you're doing and focus on passing your road test Mohammed so that's what you need to do just tune them out listen to their directions but other than that pay no attention to them do what you need to do to take away their right to fail you that's all you need to do okay oh glam the tractor plus the trailer or oh, glam are you talking about a tractor trailer you're not you don't mean 53 inches you're talking about a 53 foot trailer that's what you're talking about is it not just correct me if i'm wrong tiffany i made a fake steering wheel with a proper plate to practice my hand over hand and it works you should try it i guarantee you it will help you uh anything you can do tiffany that will help you out to practice is going to make you a better driver so the more practice you get the better driver you're going to be so there you go okay so Corey got up the video for Hag in there all right uh, Sebastian I recently went to apply for uber driver and was told I have to have my driver's license for a year I only had it for six months any advice to prepare for the best uber driver in New York <laughs> uh, basically Sebastian I think what you need to do is you just need to put in the time uh, the other thing you might want to do is you want to be studying some of the layout of New York City and know some of these back streets and those types of things because essentially what you're doing, I mean, it's I know it's certainly a lot easier in this day and age with GPS and navigation and those types of things, but still you want to have a general sense of where you're going in New York City and those types of things for driving Uber, okay? Ah, uh, Glam, yes, you're driving a 53-foot trailer. How to back it up? So the first thing you want to do, Glam, is you want to go out and find yourself a pickup truck in any trailer that you can get a hold of and practice because all of the theory for backing up a tractor trailer is exactly the same for any other type of tra uh, truck and trailer unit or car and trailer unit, whatever you can get. Uh, some basic uh, techniques and skills that you want to keep in place. Uh, setup is the most important thing in terms of backing up. And a, one of the problems that are one of the common challenges that new drivers have in terms of tractor trailers is they don't pull up far enough in order to get the unit straight and if you got the wiggle room to move forward and back up but you got the room forward you can get so you can back straight up that is your first goal is to try and back up in a straight line you don't want to be trying to maneuver the vehicle while you're backing up you want to try and get it into a straight line and then you can back up in a straight line and that's going to make it a lot easier for you and that's going to help you in terms of backing up and so remember setup is 80 percent of a successful backup and then all of the other rules apply but what i suggest to you is just to go out and get another vehicle and a trailer and back up with that and that will help you out okay ryan hi there how are you okay uh dorcas got his license last week in winnipeg winnipeg manitoba congratulations on that that's awesome i skipped you twice crazy and lazy <laughs> i didn't skip you crazy and lazy uh there's a lot of comments going past here and i'm trying to answer questions if i went past you just tell me i went past you and i'll get back to it okay turning left with a stop sign when turning into through traffic that doesn't have a stop sign so let me see if I got this right, crazy and lazy. You're at a stop sign. The rest of the traffic at the other three points of the intersection are not at a tra are not at a stop sign. Is that correct? Okay. Arzina, hi there. How are you? Okay, let's see. Um, all right. Lewis, when you press gas on release, gas does not gas... Or does it stay at the same speed? When you press gas on release, gas... Does gas slow down or does it stay at the same speed? It depends on what, what speed you're doing, Lewis, there in terms of the fuel pedal. Uh, Kota, what do you need to do when you first start driving? You need to learn how to master the primary controls, the steering wheel, the throttle, and the brakes. So what I suggest to you is go to the parking lot, get some of those 36-inch, one-meter tall pylons, and work with those in a parking lot and move around the pylons and those types of things. Uh, Dave, is there any way to... Um, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? There you go. Is there any extra securities? Is there any way to protect your car from intruders? Uh, Dave, when you're saying intruders, are you talking like thieves and vandals? Is that what you're talking about? 
Oh, how to back it into a warehouse. Okay, glam. <sighs> okay, the warehouse that you're talking about, glam, does it have lights on the dock inside the warehouse that you're trying to back the truck into? Okay, uh, Arzina, are these rules in according to America? Yes, most of the stuff that I talk about, Arzina, is applicable in the United States of America and will help you to pass a license there. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Cool, thanks. Okay. My question is when driving and when you press on the gas and then release, does the car slow down or does it stay at the same speed? Uh, most of the time, if you take your foot off the throttle, Lewis, the vehicle is going to slow down unless you're going downhill or there's some other, you know, you're going uphill or downhill. It depends whether gravity is going to have an effect on your vehicle in those. Uh, Where did we go? Sarah, what's the difference between driving lesson and a mock test? Uh, good question. Sarah, a mock road test, a practice driving test, is when a driving instructor takes you out and actually marks you on the same criteria that you're going to be marked on when you go for your driving test. So it gives you a good idea of what skills, techniques, and abilities are ne needing improvement in order to be successful on passing a road test. That's the difference between a driving lesson. And a driving lesson is when a driving instructor just takes you out and teaches you how to pass the road test. They don't actually give you any feedback about skills, abilities, and techniques that you need to improve in order to be successful on the road test, okay? Jessica, if there's a red light and I stop behind another car on the road, if the car in front of me moves up a little bit, should I move up as well during a driving test to reduce the gap? Uh, Jessica, it depends how far the other vehicle moves up. If the vehicle moves up, I would say more than a car length, then yes, move up. If it doesn't move up more than a car length, then stay where you are, okay? Okay, and Jacob passed his driving test on Saturday. Congratulations, Jacob. That's really awesome. Okay, let's say if I press gas to 20 miles an hour and release my foot off the gas, does it slow down? Does it stay at 20 miles an hour? No, Lewis, it slows down. You take your foot off the throttle, it's going to slow down. It's just gravity. It's just overcoming friction. The vehicle is just going to slow down. Okay? Uh... Okay, Dave... Um, one of the things you can do is put in a, you can put in an alarm system in your vehicle, but for the most part, alarms aren't going to stop vandals and thieves. If people want to steal your car, uh, you know, for the most part, what I suggest to you is just keep it locked at night and that deters most people. If somebody's going to get in your vehicle, if they're really determined, they're just going to break the window. Beverly, uh, right turns, are they always quick and sharp? No, they're not always quick and sharp. It depends on the curvature of the road. So it's called the splay, how much that curve is. And on major roads, that curve is going to be more. And on some older roads and those types of things, it's going to be less. So uh, it depends how sharp the right-hand curve is. Uh, Ryan, there's a video for curvy roads. Yes, there is. And Corey will find that for you. Uh, there you go. It's already there. Lucky55, five five, how are you? Hagen, what is the proper, what is the paperwork that we have to have for the road test? Uh, Hagen, you need the video on road test preparation. No. Top 10 tips to pass your road test. It's in there. But the paperwork that you need just quickly, you need two pieces of identification. You need your learner's permit and you need money because you got to pay for the road test, obviously. Okay, Dorcas. Uh, the next phase for me is how to be safe on the road. Dorcas, I have the perfect defensive driving course for you coming up this week. I should have it up tomorrow. That's my goal is to get it finished tomorrow and get it up on the website. So look for that. Uh, if not, send me a comment and I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> Fuad, it's, that's a little beyond the scope of this, this channel. But, you know, we may eventually get down to drifting here <laughs> with a front wheel drive vehicle. I think it's a little bit more challenging with a front wheel drive vehicle than it is with a, with a rear end uh, rear wheel vehicle. Uh, code reader, uh, Givenchy, uh, code reader. You're talking about a reader that plugs into the computer on your car and tells you what the codes are on your car. Is that what you're asking me, Givenchy? Because I can give you a little bit of information about that from my own personal experience but with code readers. Uh, so Ryan is here. Okay, Glabe. Okay, yes, uh, Glabe, Glam, sorry. Uh, you're asking me if there's lights on the dock. So essentially what you got to do is you got to line up with the lights on the dock. And again, glam, if there's enough room in front of the door that you want to get into, 
you want to try and get the truck straight so you can back up straight. If not, you want to come in on the driver's side and you want to back in from the driver's side and that way you're going to have more visibility than if you try and back up on the other side. I don't recommend that you're backing up on the blind side because it's just too hard. All right. Okay. See you, Dave. Have a good night. Thanks for showing. Thanks for coming all coming in and asking a couple of questions. All right, uh, Thomas, is 30 hours of experience enough to take the end test in BC? Uh, probably it is, Thomas. What I would suggest to you, Thomas, to go and get a practice driving test with a driving school, and that way you'll know for sure because they'll be able to give you feedback on your skills, abilities, and knowledge of being able to pass a test. Okay, Givenchy, so you want a code reader. Uh, my knowledge with the code readers is, is that my friend has one. Uh, a code reader and you just get a number and then you got to go to the internet and look up the number the code readers aren't very detailed they're not going to give you detailed information not like the snap can snap can <laughs> the snap on tools that's what I was trying to say snap on tools that they have at the mechanic shops the snap on tools the snap on readers of the tool at the at the mechanic shops those are two or three thousand dollar readers whereas the one you're going to buy is only going to be a hundred hundred and fifty dollars and it's not going to give you a lot of information. It's going to give you a starting point, but it's not going to give you a great deal of information. For example, my check engine light came on there a couple of weeks ago, and my my mate put his on, and he's got you know $150, $200 one. It told us that it was the catalytic converter. I took it into the uh, mechanic shop. They put the reader on it, and we were able to do a test, but in, and in the end, it was just a matter of swapping it out. And we think that the catalytic converter on my Honda was actually defective because it was actually a new one on the vehicle. So it's hard to say, you know, you kind of one half and dozen the other. If you're fairly handy and you're fairly mechanically inclined, then it may work out for you. Otherwise, it might be just easier just to take it into a shop and get them to do it for you, okay? Oh, Hagen, you're most welcome. Fuad, you're, you're most welcome. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Penny, when I turn right and left turns, how much do I move the steering wheel? Uh, Penny, if you're asking me how much you need to turn the steering wheel to turn left and right, uh, you need to look at the video, how to learn to drive a car, and, and Corey will get that up for you. Go out and get some of those 36 inch, one meter tall pylons, go in the parking lot and work with the primary controls of the vehicle. Work with the steering wheel, The fuel pedal and the brake and that will give you that will improve your overall driving ability because uh, I can't tell you because every intersection is going to be slightly different on how much you move the steering wheel and what I would suggest to you is to get some of those fundamentals in place before you go out and start practicing on the roadway okay Lewis uh, do they expect us to do the driving perfect or just as long as we get the job done? For example, are we supposed to park perfect, make a three-point turn? No, Lewis, that's a great question about perfect. You just want to pass the road test. You don't need to be perfect on the road test. You're just going for pass. If you touch a curb or rub something or the car's not straight when you reverse park and those types of things, it's not a big deal, right? We're going for pass. Remember, after you get your license, nobody's ever going to ask you, oh, what was your mark on your road test? Nobody's ever going to ask you that, okay? It's kind of like my like going to university. When you're finished, nobody after you get your degree, nobody's ever going to say, "Oh, what did you? What, what mark did you get?" Nobody's ever going to say that, right? So you just we're going for pass, okay? Uh, hall phase. What do you do? <laughs> Seems to be a common theme tonight. What do you do if you do your fail your road test? Now, hall. This is what you do. You can retake your road test for sure. So that's the first thing I want to say. However, take a day, be down. Okay, go home, sit in your underwear, watch uh, reruns of I Love Lucy, eat Doritos, be mad at the world, blame the examiner. But after a day, go back, start practice again, rebook your road test, and then do it again. Okay, so it's not the end all and be all, and there's certainly no indication of who you as a person are. You only fail a road test when you give up, so keep going, okay? Givenchy, yeah, because I drive a BMW and check engine lights are notorious, so I was thinking of buying a reader. Yeah, it might help you out, Givenchy, but again, at the, on the other hand, is, is if the, do, the check engine light does come on, you may not be able to fix it yourself. It's, you know, that's just one half dozen the other, okay? Tommy, do you have any general tips for driving as part of a funeral procession? What are the rules in terms of right away for the procession in Ontario? Uh, Tommy, some funeral processions have uh, green lights. Traffic is usually pretty good in terms of funeral processions. Uh, traffic usually stops and waits for the funeral procession to go by. 
Uh, you just want to keep good space in front of your vehicle. Follow the vehicle in front of you because, you know, most of you are all going to the same destination, obviously. And uh, you just want to keep good space between you and the vehicles in front of you and just look farther down the road. And then you're going to be okay in terms of what's going on in those types of things, okay? So, yeah. And, you know, they tend to travel slower as well. You know, usually not much faster than 30 miles an hour. So you're going to be okay for that. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to head over to the PowerPoint presentation here quickly. And I'm going to get that going if I can here. See what happens here. There we go. Okay. Bear with me for one second. Okay, defensive driving. So we're going to talk about defensive driving tonight. As I said, I've been working on the course. And as some of you may or may not know, uh, just I need to figure this out here a little bit. There we go. Okay. Uh, some of you may or may not know the most crashes happen in the year uh, in the summertime. So it's June and July. I'm still working on getting... This, there we go. Okay, I got it now. Just trying to get all this working here. So most of the traffic crashes occur in the summertime. So if you guys are newer drivers and you're starting to drive now in the summertime, this is when you're going to be most susceptible at being involved in a traffic crash. And this is sort of why I'm doing the... Uh, Defensive driving, once again, just reiterating some of this and going over this. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Rick August. Uh, you've seen me in most of my videos. If you've watched any of the videos here on Smart Drive Test, I was a truck driver in the 1990s. I became a licensed driving instructor in 1997. I've been a, So I've been a driving instructor for 20 years. Uh, I have a doctorate in legal history. And for those of you who don't know, legal history is the study of policing, courts, prisons, or policing, courts and prisons and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic and while I was going to university in Australia I drove Greyhound for Australia for a while and drove buses as well so I have experience uh, as a bus and truck driver and I've been a driving instructor and I started the smart drive test uh, YouTube channel a couple of years ago to help other people get their license uh, remain crash free and start a career as a truck or bus driver so people who wanted to earn a living as a driver so that's what we're doing here on smart drive test and uh, been successful lots of people in the last few weeks uh, getting their license and being successful in those endeavors and helping to people to do all of that so defensive driving uh, the first thing you need to overcome in terms of social driving and, and we've talked about this a little bit tonight in terms of passing a road test and what you need to do especially if you have an ogre of an examiner and there are ogres out there who just really are not helping you at all and really are more interested in seeing you fail than seeing you pass and what you need to do is you need to block them out. It's kind of like social driving. You need to work against social driving so that you can remain safe on the roadway. You need to put habits in place. And when I talk about social driving, uh, driving is a social activity. We work with other people in a group. And most of the time, unfortunately, we feel compelled to drive in a group when that's not your safest uh, defensive posturing. You need to be in the spaces between the groups of cars on the roadway. And the other thing for social driving, most vehicles speed. They drive 10 to 15 miles an hour above the posted speed, speed limit or 5 to 10 kilometers above the posted speed limit. They accelerate through yellow lights. There's always pressure to go and pressure not to uh, impede other traffic on the roadway. Uh, they don't stop at uh, stop signs. Uh, sorry, that should be stop signs, not red lights. And there's often road rage associated with you holding up other traffic or inadvertently cutting somebody off or those types of things. So these, these are some of the hallmarks of social driving and this is some of the stuff that you need to overcome in, in terms of being a defensive driver. Now one of the first things that you need to do is you need to be able to navigate because for those of you taking driving lessons what happens is, is that you go around in driving lessons and a person tells you to go left, turn right, turn left, turn right and they know where they're going. Now you get your license and you get in a vehicle and all of a sudden you don't know where to go and a lot of places that you just took for granted your whole life because your parents went to the doctor every couple of weeks or took you there every month or whatnot, they know how to get to the doctor. You now don't know how to get to the doctor and you have to get there even there, though you've lived there your whole life. You've ridden around in somebody else's car to get to the doctor. Now you have to figure out how to do that. And if you're going on holidays this summer, you're going out with your friends and those types of things, you're going to have to get to unknown uh, destinations. And how, how you do that is with Google Maps. 
Uh, if you're uncertain with Google Maps or your GPS or your phone does not give you clear directions, get help from somebody by calling uh, the destination. Make sure that you plan breaks. If you're traveling with children, make sure you have activities for the children and those types of things. And if you get lost or you get rerouted by the GPS and you're not understanding the directions, make sure that you pull over and take a look at it. And again, as I said, if you're traveling with children, one of the things you can do is go to the library and get audiobooks. It's a book and it has a CD with it and it will play on the player and they can read along and listen to the book and those types of things. I find those really, really good for my kids as well. Have games, have accessibility to food and drink in the car as well and lots of blankets where they get cold or they fall asleep or those types of things. All of that will keep them occupied and, you know, <laughs> it'll be a much more pleasant ride for you and whatnot. So make sure you plan breaks. One of the things you want to do on longer summer trips or if you're going camping, as it was the, um, the long weekend here in Canada this weekend, uh, and those types of things, make sure you plan breaks every couple of hours. Make, if you've got children, make sure you stop at a, a playground or some other place that they can run around. And know that you don't want to eat heavy meals at restaurants and those types of things because that's going to make you drowsy on longer trips and whatnot. So make sure you get out and get a bit of exercise and go for a walk and whatnot. Now, the other thing that you're going to deal with in terms of defensive driving is you're going to deal with night driving and inclement weather. I'm going to touch on just a couple of these. One of these that I want to touch on is glaring sun. One of the most dangerous times of the days to drive is at dusk and dawn, more so at dusk, because you're going to get this glaring sun and you're going to be driving into this glaring sun. And a couple of techniques and strategies that you can put in place is that you can wear sunglasses, put down the visor, uh, look to the outer edge of the road, make sure you drive in the outside lane. Uh, for those of us who are on the right side of the road in the world, drive on the right side of the road. And for those of you on the left side of the road, drive on the left lane. Okay, visor down, turn on your headlights so other traffic can see you and those types of things. And know that it's going to fatigue you. But know it's only going to last for, you know, an hour at the most because it's sunset and it's glaring sun and it's just right at the horizon. The other thing that's in uh, you're in danger of is that uh, small road users, cyclists, pedestrians, and those types of things are going to be hiding in the dark landscape and your eyes are adjusted to the bright sky. So know that as well, that that's one of the other inherent dangers of driving uh, during sunset and sunrise. Okay. For new drivers, complex intersections and complex in intersections are uh, some of the features of these complex intersections are multiple lanes, slip lanes, turning lanes, traffic lights, overhead lane use signs and road markings and make sure you stay beside, behind the stop sign. Make sure you get into the turning lanes immediately as they start and make sure you watch the traffic lights. If you're making left hand turns here, know that you might have to go on the yellow lot, light and know that if you go on the yellow light, ensure that the traffic, the oncoming traffic has completely come to a stop before you commit to crossing uh, the path of oncoming traffic because it's especially dangerous for pedestrians who are passengers who would be in your vehicle. Now here is one of the keys to defensive driving is keeping living room around your vehicle. Keep space around your vehicle. Space management was one of the keys to remaining crash free because as I tell students again and again, if you're not near other road users, if you're not near fixed objects, it's less likely that you're going to hit something on the roadway. As well, always, always leave your escape route because it's faster to steer out of an emergency than it is to brake out of an emergency. So keep space around your vehicle. And you can always control the space in front of your vehicle. And if somebody does cut in front of you and takes the space in front of you, just simply release the throttle, slow down a little bit, and they'll be gone. And then you can just regain your gap in front of your vehicle and those types of things. And as well, in combination with that, keep good scanning patterns. And you can see here in the image here, you can see the pickup truck here. This pickup truck is driving. Here's a cluster of vehicles. You don't want to be in this cluster of vehicles. You want to be where this pickup truck is between this cluster and the cluster behind him because I can guarantee you there's another cluster behind him. And that's where you want to drive. That's your best defensive posturing when you're driving. Okay, if you do break down on your summer trips or your vehicle breaks down, unfortunately, don't pull off on the side of the highway unless it is an absolute emergency. In other words, your vehicle won't get going. If you are off on the side of the road and your vehicle has stopped and will not continue, put your four-way flashers on. If you can limp it up to an off-ramp, get off in an off-ramp or a back road or something like that. And the other piece that I always encourage students, have a charging cord in your vehicle. That way you keep your cell phone charged up because if you break down, you want to be able to call for help. You want to be able to call for roadside assistance 
and have them come out and change a tire or tow your vehicle or whatever needs to be done. And in the winter time, make sure you have a survival kit in your vehicle because you might get stuck in the side of the road in a snowbank or something like that for an extended period of time. So uh, night driving, if you are finding yourself driving in the summertime and you're driving at night, know that you're your body is predisposed to go to sleep between one and five in the morning so know that you're going to be up against fatigue at night you want to be looking for landmarks you want to look for road markings you want to follow other traffic because for the most part other traffic is going to be uh driving on the roadway looking for utility poles and looking for signs that are along the roadway all of this will give you clues as to where the road is going and where you need to aim your vehicle at night the other thing that will reduce fit fatigue at night Keep the glass and the mirrors cleaned and turn down your dash lights as much as you can because those bright dash lights are going to draw your eyes down to your dash because our eyes are attracted to light and movement and it's also going to uh, accelerate fatigue so you can reduce the amount of fatigue by turning your dash lights down at night. All of that is going to help. All right. Uh, so we talked a little bit about fatigue and knowing that you're going to have to sometimes drive at night and don't try not to push through if you do need to get over and get some sleep get some sleep uh, and as well uh, a couple of ways that you can stay awake talk to somebody else have a hands-free cell phone you can talk to somebody else CB radio if you're in a big truck or uh, eat carrots that's what I used to do I always had a 10 peg 10 pound bag of carrots down beside the seat and I ate carrots so that's how I stayed awake at night so that's some of the ways you can do that and this so as I said this quick overview of some of the defensive driving course and I'm getting up the defensive driving course over at the smart drive test this uh, website this week and that'll be available for you to purchase and it'll give you more in-depth on each one of these topics uh, there's six topics in the course and uh, types of crashes uh, distracted driving and climate weather and uh, navigation and route planning intersections and backing and reversing so I go into much more detail in each one of those as well as there's uh, cheat sheets and uh, checklists of things that you can do and there's multiple choice questions and you get a certificate at the end that you did in fact complete an online uh, defensive driving course so that's what uh, I'm getting up and ready for you this week so I'll just come back here and answer some more questions there we go we'll head over to Smart drive test, there we go. All right. This computer is definitely a lot slower. There we go. Christian, how are you? How are you? Epic 112 is here. Uh, thanks so much, Epic 112. Uh, I'm not sure if small gap between yourself and the car in front is safe or real wheel visible method. Oh no, um, so Epic 112, are you talking about traveling down the road? Because if you're traveling down the road, you should have a space between you and the vehicle of two to three seconds, not, not the tires on the pavement. The tires on the pavement is only when you stop in traffic. That's what you should be doing. Okay, um, here we go, here we go. Okay, Tommy, you're most welcome. Hall phase, what do you do at a four-way stop? Okay. Uh, hall phase for a four-way stop. Uh, Corey will get that video up for you. There's a video on that. The other thing I would suggest hall phase if you have a four-way stop in and around where you live, just go down there during a busy hour and just observe what the traffic pattern is. Uh, but basic rules are vehicle on the right, first vehicle to arrive, and then it's straight through traffic has the right of way over turning traffic and right hand turning vehicles have the right of way over left turning vehicles. And if you have opposing lanes of traffic both this way and they're both turning left, so they'll be going left. If they're both turning left, they can turn left at the same time. So that's a very quick overview of uh, four way stops. Uh, Rice, this seems to be a popular question tonight. What should I do if I fail my road test? <laughs> Okay, Rice, you can retake the test. It's not an indication of who you are as a person. Go home, sit in your underwear, uh, watch uh, reruns of Firefly, eat Doritos, be mad at the driving examiner, and then the next day, get up, do it again, get back on the horse, practice, rebook your road test, and go and do it again. Now, the other thing that I suggest, Rice, is to go and do a practice driving test with a driving school. That will help you out and give you information about the skills and abilities and techniques that you may have to strengthen to be successful on a road test. So that's what you do. Okay, Sarah, how to change lane in a crowded traffic and nobody gives you a chance to change lanes during driving test. Uh, Sarah, 
put your signal on, leave your signal on. Eventually, somebody will let you over. Promise, guarantee. Okay, so just be tenacious and keep going. Brian, how are you? Thanks for fear and anxiety videos. So much more relaxed. My last three drives have known how to do drive. Just struggled. Excellent. That's great. Awesome. I'm glad that I'm glad that you're getting more comfortable, Ryan. That's really great to hear. Okay. Uh, there we go. Slow speed maneuvers. It's a great uh, playlist for all of the maneuvers that you need to do for the purposes of a road test. They're all in that playlist. Okay. Okay, John. We answered the question. John, did you get an answer to that question about what happens if you fail your road test? I told you you can take it again, right? Okay, uh, Neural, where'd you go? Uh, Givenchy, I'm doing my G-test tips anytime soon. Yes, Givenchy, what you need to do, four basic components of any road test, observation, communication, space management, speed management. Okay, so speed management, you either, need, either need to do the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Space management, don't get near any other road users or fixed objects. Uh, you're less likely to be involved in a crash if you can manage space around your vehicle. Observation, you need to have your scanning patterns in place, okay? You need to look far down the road, uh, check your center mirror far down the road, look at your wing mirrors far down the road, check your instrument panel, okay? So you're constantly scanning as you're driving your vehicle. Anytime you move the vehicle laterally, you're going to shoulder check, you're going to shoulder check to the right, you're going to shoulder check to the left. All right, uh, before you do your maneuvers and your parking maneuvers and those types of things, make sure you do a 360 degree scan before you start backing up. So look forward, look to both sides, and then look out the back window while you're backing up. That's observation. Then um, communication, you need to communicate with other road users uh, effectively. You need to use your lights, your horn, uh, hand gestures, appropriate hand gestures, eye contact, and the position of your vehicle will t indicate to other traffic what you're doing and what your intents are on the road. So those are the four basic components. Speed management, space management, observation, communication. That's what you need to do to pass a road test. And again, I recommend a practice driving test before you go for your road test. Okay. Uh, Wonderland, thank you for everything. You're truly awesome. Thank you so much for that compliment. Quick question. Should I mostly keep in the right lane when driving? and what to do when a truck is pushing behind bullying thank you okay so Riaz, um are you talking about driving in the right lane for the purposes of a road test or are you are you talking about driving in the right lane for the purposes of driving after you get your road test um all phase wire lines at the oh mto vehicle place so long <laughs> all phase yeah, you'd almost think they were handing out donuts and coffee there. So make sure you show up early so that you can get in and do what you need to do uh, before your road test. Okay, Lewis, let's say when I am turning and I see a pedestrian, I struggle with the wheel. Do I hold it in the middle of my turn and brake to let the pedestrian cross or release the wheel? Uh, no, Lewis, you're going to hold the wheel steady and you're going to come to a stop. Okay, creeper face. I'm upset. I failed my road test and I don't know what to do now. Okay, creeper. Take some time, be down, but put a time limit on how long you're down, okay? Be down for a day, be down for two days. At the end of two days, it's not a reflection of who you are as a person. Rebook the test, do a bit more practice, take the feedback, maybe book a practice driving test with a driving school. You can do it. You can do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, okay? So just get back, practice, go do your road test again, okay? Okay, Salda, as an Alda, what is the best way to pass the test? I'm 23 and don't want to pay $400 for driving school. I can do the basics, but doing parallel parking and backing around a corner are hard for me. Okay, so Salda, what I suggest to you, go and get some of those 36 inch, one meter tall pylons, go and work in a parking lot. You can do, you can learn how to parallel park. You can learn how to do the uh, two point reverse turn around corners. You can do all of that without a driving school. And then what I suggest to you, instead of spending $400, just go and hire a driving school for 30 minutes or 45 minutes and get them to do a practice driving test for you. That way you can just go out and you'll know exactly where you are and what skills and abilities and techniques you need to improve to be successful on your road test, okay? Thomas, how to remain optimistic when learning to drive? I'll tell you right now, Thomas, smile. Force yourself to smile. It will make you feel better about life. It's one thing. Learn to smile. Uh, look at the video here on fear and anxiety and con constantly say to yourself, 
I am a good driver. I am a safe driver. I can do this. Okay. The four strongest words in the English language. I can do this. Okay. You can do it. Okay. Ryan. Thank you so much, Ryan. Good night and uh, take care my friend. Okay. Creeper, you are most welcome. Saul, thank you so much. Givenchy, do you think my examiner will care if my check engine light is on? I don't think I'll have enough time to get it fixed beforehand. Uh, Givenchy, I wouldn't worry too much about your check engine light as long as the vehicle goes up and down the road and doesn't stall while you're driving. Uh, you can just say that you need a new catalytic converter or something like that. <laughs> something that brings the check engine light on. All right, so we're wrapping up here. Oh, there's a question. Thomas, uh, no. Okay. Hall phase, what should I do if someone is tailgating me? And I talk about this in the defensive driving course. Hall phase, what you need to do if somebody is tailgating you is you need to increase your following distance in the front because now you're driving for yourself and you're driving for the person that's tailgating you. So you don't want to make aggressive movements. You don't want to brake hard, you don't want to steer hard, and you don't want to accelerate hard. So what you want to do is you want to keep good space in front of your vehicle so that you can brake more gently in those types of things, okay? So that's what you want to do. You simply want to increase the following distance in front of your vehicle. All right. Do -do -do -do. I think we've answered most of the questions here. So if we're just about done, then what we're going to do. <laughs> because hall phase, I don't have any more questions. And if nobody has questions, I guess I can tell you stories. <laughs> uh. I'm here as long as you're asking questions, Hall Phase. As long as you're asking questions, I'm here and more than willing to help you out with your questions. Okay, so I appreciate that. All right. Paul, what is the best time to downshift from fifth to fourth at 70 miles an hour? Uh, Paul, now, <laughs> why do you want to downshift from fifth to fourth at 70 miles an hour? Why do you want to do that? Just let me know. <laughs> okay, so one of the other things I want to talk to you about, just briefly, this is, this is more to do with congestion and commercial trucks. Uh, last week, yeah, nine days ago now, I ordered a fridge for my tenant in Victoria on Vancouver Island. And... Uh, I didn't get the fridge on time when they said that they were going to deliver it and essentially the store basically told me that you know they didn't guarantee that they were going to deliver the store deliver the uh the appliance on the day that they said they were going to but uh, one of the things that is interesting about this is there's something called jit freight it's called just in time freight in the late 1980s and early 1990s the big automotive companies woke up and realized that they were spending hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, warehousing and property to house parts to run their assembly lines. And somebody came up with the idea that what they would do is, is that instead of warehousing all of this product, they would, they would create something called just-in-time freight. Or, yeah, just-in-time freight, JIT freight. So what they did was is they went to the muffler manufacturer and they, they said, well, we're not going to, we're not going to order 3,000 mufflers now. What we're going to do is we're going to call you up and we're going to say, listen, we need 823 mufflers and we need them delivered to the plant tonight at 8 o'clock. And essentially what they delivered, they created was JIT freight. And they, instead of warehousing this product in warehouses on property, they now warehouse it in trucks on the roadway. Now we have astronomical numbers of trucks going up and down our roadways. It's the same thing with what happened with the refrigerator. That instead of warehousing or having the refrigerator in the store, they now just call up the uh, appliance manufacturer and they say, listen, we need this refrigerator. We need you to ship it out. And you, we order it online. And that's how it happens. It's the same thing with Amazon and those types of things. What's happened is, is that we've created enormous numbers of vehicles on the roadway because of all of this product being transported, not in bulk, but now being transported at one or two at a time. And we've created more traffic on our roadways and we've created more congestion. But at one and the same time, a lot of these companies are not responsible for delivering this stuff on time when they're delivering it just to a single consumer, such as myself. Now, if I order 200 of them, yeah, maybe they might get them on time. But when I'm just ordering one, it's not, a, it's not, um, not going to be guaranteed. Now, the other thing that's happened with all of this is that if you're experiencing more congestion in, in metropolitan areas, this is one of the reasons why we're experiencing more congestion because there's more trucks and those types of things 
on our on our highways and whatnot delivering products that we want all right okay uh hall phase i'm 18 years old learning how to drive in waco texas uh there you go excellent thank you so much hall phase i'm glad that we're helping you out and paul you're going out on the freeway okay paul you do not um i would not suggest that you downshift from fifth to fourth gear at 70 miles an hour simply leave it in gear leave it in fifth gear and use the brakes to slow down when you get when the vehicle starts to come up against that gear when it reaches when the tachometer reaches approximately 1000 rpm then shift down to fourth gear but don't shift down to slow down just slow down and Corey will get you the downshifting video here and that'll help you out for learning how to downshift a manual transmission okay uh, Hall phase what is the worst car bike accident I've seen uh, Hall phase I don't have one I don't I haven't seen a, a bad car wreck I did see a car wreck but nobody was injured nobody was hurt fortunately in North Carolina where a pickup truck drove into the side of a logging truck but the guy basically walked away from it. Now, I have investigated some of these crashes and any crash that results in brain injury is a terrible crash because you never ever recover from a brain injury. And it just, it's terrible. It's really awful, okay? So those are the worst kinds of crashes as far as I'm concerned. Danielle, I have my driving test tomorrow morning. I'm starting to feel sick, not from nerves, just cold. Should I rebook the test or is it safe to drive if I only have the beginning of the cold? Uh, Danielle, if it's just the beginning of the cold, then you're probably okay to go, okay? Just, um, you know, uh, take as much vitamin C as you can, try to get to bed early, get some sleep, and then go and do your test tomorrow. You know, I wouldn't rebook it if you don't have to. You're ready for it, you're practiced, you, want to just, you just want to go, okay? There we go. Uh, Y3R, bricks for wheels. Yes, he is the moderator. <laughs> yes, he is. Corey is the moderator. That's Bricks for Wheels. So Brick is Bricks for Wheels. That's him. You are most welcome, Paul. Okay, and there we go. So yes, Hall Phase. Do you think people should wear helmets and padding when driving in a car? <laughs> no, Hall. I don't. I don't think that people should wear helmets, but they sh definitely should wear their seatbelts for sure. Uh, passenger vehicles have a lot of safety features built into them and oftentimes we don't travel at speeds enough but uh, no I don't think that people should wear helmets and cars and padding and those types of things you know five point seat belts and fire suits and whatnot so uh, Suman how are you there you go there's the downshifting video excellent okay and I think we're going to wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. So if anybody has any further questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions as well. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes at the end of the live feed here and answer any other questions you have. So uh, what else? Yes, hall phase. There's no doubt that if people are wearing helmets and uh, those types, you know, roll cages and five point seat belts and those whatnot, yes, they're definitely going to be safer. But I'm old enough to have been around in the early 1970s, mind you I was a kid at the time, uh, when they brought in seatbelt laws and the pushback and reluctance for drivers to wear seatbelts was incredible. So to get people to wear helmets and five point seatbelts and fire suits when they drive their car, uh, uh, you have states in the, United, in the US there that motorcycle riders don't wear helmets and I have talked to these people and they truly believe that it is their God-given right not to wear a motorcycle helmet so if you can't get people to wear a helmet on a motorcycle imagine the pushback that you're going to experience trying to get people to wear a, mo a helmet inside of an automobile if they're not racing you're going to be uh, you're going to get incredible pushback and, re and resistance to do that so that's yeah <laughs> Uh, what's one of the things you should know hall phase one of the things you should know and I'll leave this with you and we're gonna wrap up here after I answer this question the one thing that you should know in terms of learning how to drive know that slow speed maneuvers working with the primary controls in a parking lot all of that is going to improve your overall driving and make you a better driver so that's where you need to start if you get good with the fundamentals the rest of it's going to be easy okay Lewis is there a video on places to park and not park uh, no, Lewis, there isn't a place to park, but what you just need to do, Lewis, is you need to look at the signs, whether it's paid parking or whether parking is restricted. 
but that is a good suggestion for a video that maybe I should put that up there about uh, how to tell whether you can park in a spot or not and those types of things. Christian, in which province CDL available on visitor visa? Uh, Christian, I don't think we have any pro any provinces that, uh, w when you're asking me about a CDL license, are you talking about getting a license here or you have a license and you're going to be able to work here? You're not going to be able to work here on a visitor visa. If you're going to work in Canada, you have to get a work visa in order to work here in Canada and drive a truck, okay? Jake, oh, sorry to hear about that, that you were unsuccessful on your road test. Uh, what should you do? Jake, take a day, be down, sit in your underwear, watch uh, reruns of, which one should we watch? Uh, <laughs> we've already watched all the other ones. Oh, yes, watch reruns of Happy Days, eat Doritos, drink lots of chocolate milk, and be miserable. Okay, do that for a day, and then after a day, go and rebook your road test and practice. Take on board some of the feedback that you got. Uh, if you need to or you think that it's going to help you out, uh, book a practice driving test and then go out and start practice again and retake your road test. Know, Jake, that it is not a reflection of who you are that you weren't successful on your road test. I know it sucks and it's not, it's, it's really terrible, but take it again and you're going to do all right, okay? So we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you, everybody, for showing up, for your time, asking your questions. Thank you, Hall Face, for all the great questions about passing a road test and all the people that were unsuccessful in their road test. That's unfortunate, but you're going to take it again. You're going to be successful. Congratulations to everybody who passed in the last week. Good luck for everybody who has a road test coming up this week. Good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.